Hey, how's everybody doing today? I am really excited on this episode of Coffee Talk with Brohawk. I have Bob Furness with me, and I am so excited to have Bob um, as a guest on today's episode. Um, Bob, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and, and what you're up to these days. So our connection is ACCA, right? Uh, yes, that's from correct. Way back in the day, I um, I spoke at ACCA. I was trying to figure it out the other day. I bet it's been 10 years, maybe maybe yeah. longer, uh, since I spoke at their conference. Um, I, your org that organization is always one that I, I, I refer to as a local organization that has their stuff together. So, so great to have the conversation. Great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, if, if you haven't figured out by the time we finish talking that I love this stuff, um, you can refer to my Twitter where that's the handle that I use constantly, the hashtag I use, because I, I really do love what happens in the contact center space. Um, I've been in the contact center space my entire career. I started out as an online agent many, many years ago, way too many years ago. Um, and, um, have been a consultant now in this space for almost 20 years and just believe that it is an industry that if you love people, you're in the right place. If mm -hmm. you don't like working with people, then you're probably not in the right place. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter how good technology gets. It's still a people business. It is. It is. Um, and I love that, that, um, you know, love this stuff. Uh, I mean, you know, the the people just don't understand how how energizing this this industry can be, um, you know, when they first get into it. And it's like, no, this is this is this is like an adrenaline rush every single day. Um, and I know when I've seen you speak before, um, not just at um, ACCA, but in other places <coughs> as well, um, that uh, um that you can tell that enthusiasm and that that adrenaline rush that you bring to to it uh, as well. So, well, and I I currently you ask about what I do. I currently lead yeah. a team at Slalom, which is a a, a, a national a global contact. Uh, I mean, a consulting firm. We yep. uh, help companies improve their uh, their business, and um, I lead a team of consultants around contact centers support and service. We're in the Salesforce space at Slalom. And so we help companies implement service cloud and field service. My team does digital uh, digital engagement. My, I've got a, a, a team of freaky smart people that are doing some really <laughs> cool stuff around AI in the chatbot world. Um, we've all talked to a really bad chatbot, but you probably haven't talked to our chatbots because we got some really cool stuff going on. So, um, I don't know how I got into the technology space. I was I was had my own company, and I got a call from the uh, one of the leaders at Blue Wolf about ten years ago, and uh -huh. a friend of mine. You know, I, I knew what Salesforce was, but that was before Service Cloud was really something. Service Cloud was just making its debut, and a friend of mine said that if you could uh, if you could tie your wag if you could tie your wagon to Salesforce for the next ten years, you should buy a rope. Yeah. So I jumped into the middle of the Salesforce world and have not looked back. And I, I love the fact that I get to help companies um, improve customer experience. But I think we do that back to the people. If I if I can get a, an agent to look at me in UAT and go, this is going to change my life, <laughs> then, we, then we've done our job right. We've done what we're yes. supposed to do as consultants. You know, it, it's funny you mentioned that because a lot of people will say, hey, let's go ahead and bring technology in and that's going to solve all of our problems. But they miss the alignment between people and processes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, yeah. You, you just can't, you can't discount what that, what that agent brings to the table. Yes. Um, be, because, you know, work from home has changed so much of what we do mm -hmm. and how we do what we do. But the reality is, 
is the job for the agent has gotten harder because we keep scraping the easy stuff off. We, mm -hmm. we first scraped the easy stuff off with IVRs and then we scraped it off with websites and then we scraped it off with social. And now we're scraping it off with bots and AI assistants and online knowledge. And yes. so now what you've got left is an agent that's expected to know everything that the bot knows and the knowledge mm -hmm. management system knows and, everything that's on the website and everything that's in training. And it's become even more than it was when I started out as an agent. You know, we we just didn't have all of those communication channels. We, we were starting from zero. Yeah. And it feels like a lot of times where we start with an agent today is, hey, I'm on page 10 as a customer. Are you with me? Are, yeah. are you, do you, do you already know what I know as a customer? Because I'm going to start asking you questions on page 10, not on page one. Exactly. And, you know, what's interesting about that is me as a customer to your organization, um, I'm on page 10, but I'm comparing your ex the experience that I have with you <coughs> to everybody else that, I, that I'm doing business with also. So... Yeah, your competitor is not your not the guy in the same business you are. Your competitor is the last great experience that I had. By the way, I apologize for the cough. I've got some kind of allergies that is uh, me. I'm not sick. I just have <laughs> a consistent cough that I started taking allergy meds for. So I apologize. Hopefully it's not annoying hey. to the fact of people going, okay, that's enough. You know, I, I, if if uh, the last two and a half years ha hasn't has taught us anything, it's Hey, we, we need to we need to be okay with with not being okay sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You are definitely correct about that. You know, um, you know, Bob, how you know, you and I have been in, in the industry for for a minute or two. I think we both started when we were like two or three. Uh, um, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it, and you know, when we when we were in, you know, back in the early nineties, IVRs were early to mid nineties, IVRs were going to take over contact centers and there were going to be no agents left. Um, but you know, you're somebody that that's worked with a lot of organizations and, and a lot of different leaders over your career. You know, what are some of the, the challenges contact centers are experiencing today? And how are these challenges different today than, you know, maybe they were 20 years ago or even pre pandemic? You know, Mark, I I think you'd probably agree that there's a multitude, a high percentage of them that, that aren't that different. The, yep. the technology is different. Um, you know, work from home has changed the way we do things. You know, we used to hear from banks and insurance companies and uh, healthcare companies that, oh my gosh, we could never send our agents home. And then one day on a Thursday, we said we're sending everybody home on Monday and yes. we'll figure it out. Um, uh -huh. And now we're bringing people back, but now we got this hybrid thing going on. So I think that the biggest struggle that that brings is more about the people that work mm -hmm. for us than it is. It, it definitely affects the customer experience, yep. but I, I think it's also about, the people that work for us, like how do we communicate the way we used to communicate? Uh, if you had asked me, what's probably the best thing a supervisor can do walking around doing in, in, a, in their contact center today? What's what's the best, if they had 30 minutes, what could they do that would help them? Yeah. I would say management by walking around, the old Ken Blanchard, uh, MBWAH <laughs> or whatever it is, management by walking around. Yeah. And it, now I can't do that. Nobody's yes. here. I, I, we we had a group of consultants at an 800 position contact center recently that had 40 people in the contact center. Uh, no, nobody's nobody's there. And so adapting to that, what's interesting about that, and I had this conversation with a consulting buddy friend of mine the other day that, you know, in some ways, Slack and Teams allows me to be more connected mm -hmm. in some ways than I was when I could get up and walk around. Because yeah. when I was sitting at my desk for seven hours a day and I wasn't walking around the contact center, I, I didn't get a lot of feedback unless somebody came to my desk as a supervisor and asked me a question. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm sort of multitasking and I see that this person has this question and 
I can sort of follow along. I've got a, a, a group of consultants working on a project um, for healthcare organization and, and they're on a Teams channel. And as the leader, I can sort of keep up with what's happening in, in, in my, in my not my contact center, but my, my consulting organization. Uh -huh. I can chime in, I can add value, I can send a meme, I can try to make people laugh. So communication, I think. So we're sort of back to that people management piece. Okay. But the, the other piece is, what are we really going to do with this A&I, AI mm -hmm. situation? Like, what, what's the value? Are chatbots really going to be something, or is this just something that was a passing the night idea? Um, I've got a mm -hmm. consulting friend of mine that'll tell you real quick, he hates chatbots. <laughs> I hate bad chatbots. Yep. Um, I hate chatbots that don't allow me to go find and talk to a human person if I want to. But mm -hmm. wow, there's some value in the fact that an agent no longer has to look up who I am, but by the fact that I'm authenticated and I'm on the bot and it can tell the agent who I am and it can validate what my products are and what my services are and it can recommend information to the chat agent mm -hmm. or it can push back to me the recommendation of what I might be calling about and Hey, do you have questions about this? Can I help you without you ever talking to a human? Those yeah. kind of interactions are positive. So AI, AI is has value. I, I love what Peter Coffey says. I I, re, I repeat this a lot, but I love what Peter Coffey says. He said to me that AI is really something and a value when it's not called AI anymore. So okay. think about that for a minute. Siri. You uh -huh. don't ever think Siri is, well, I just interacted with AI. You just think, yeah. I tried to make Siri do what I wanted her to do <laughs> faster. She, she wanted wanted the information faster than my brain could calculate sometimes. Uh -huh. Alexa, who's now going to wake up over there on my on my, on my my uh, coffee table. Um, you know, AI is something that helps us do something that we were doing ro rotely there's value in that. You know, just like just like IVR when it first came out, um, you know, and I keep on going back to this, IVR solved a lot of problems, um, you know, back when it first came out. It made sure calls got to the right people. Um, IVR self-service then evolved out of it. And, and evolution, you're right, chat, chat bots, um, you know, can can really help. And, you know, where an agent might be, required to or in the day required to take 200 calls a day and the leadership knew that 60 percent of those were password resets yeah um now now that can all be done through chatbot or looking up hours of operation or you know anything you know do you have this this particular product in stock um you're right chatbots that are built right um you know, can can make a an agent and a contact center much more efficient and create a, that better customer experience where when you do get to an agent, you're actually get talking to somebody that can take the time to to um, to fix your problem, fix it, get exactly. you a resolution. Exactly. You know, and just like you can have bad chatbots, you had a lot of bad IVRs in the day too. <laughs> we still do in some cases. Still do exactly, exactly. Um, you know, we're talking a little bit about technology and how much it's advanced through, through our careers, but, you know, a, a lot of customer service is still reactive, um, you know, with, with people that, that you're working with or that you're, that you're interacting with, uh, Bob, do you see uh, a trend towards more proactive, um, customer service with the tools and products that are out there? Yeah, definitely. We, I was talking this week with a healthcare company about, their contact center. And we were talking about this very fact that um, what are you doing around self-service, which is mm -hmm. more interactive. So I ask a question, I'm looking for an answer, but what are you doing that's proactive? What are you notifying the customer? Um, I, I, I realize that we talk about Amazon too much in, in our industry, but they, if you just think for a moment, all of the different places that you get automated 
interactions from from Amazon about a single package, you yep. realize why it's so hard to find their 800 number is because I probably don't need it. Yep. Um, and so what we what we find is you have to be on purpose about it. So if you're running a contact center, take a, an hour, take 30 minutes, take an yep. hour and a half this week. Get into a room with with a whiteboard, or get into sit down next to your desk with a notebook paper, and think about what are my top 20, 10 or fifteen or twenty contact contacts that come into my contact center. Mm -hmm. And if in a perfect world, how would I avoid that contact? What what would I do to proactively? do something, either send an email, send a text, send a chat, um, send an app notice. Uh, what would I do that would allow us to not ever receive that that request, not ever have that question? And you're not gonna you're not gonna scrape them all off. Even if you get 20% of what's mm. on your list, your savings and your cost will be worth whatever the cost is to create that interact that proactive notification. So yeah, I, I think we sometimes get caught up in the self-service and the knowledge piece. And we forget that proactive, how do I avoid the call? Not how do I deflect the call? Yeah. And those are, those are two different things. Avoiding the call is better than deflecting it. And yeah. I hate the word. I don't know how you feel about that, but I hate, I hate the word deflect. It sounds like something yes. I'm going to do to my customer. Exactly. I like give them a better option for, for <laughs> finding their answer. That, that sounds better than deflection. <laughs> I, I I would totally agree. I, I'm not a big fan of, of deflection. Um, um, you know, I, I, I definitely view it as, as um, routing to get to the answer faster or get to a resolution faster. Yeah. Um, you know, and you're right. I mean, you know, the, the companies, you know, really need to look at those at, at Hey, can I chop 20% of my call volume off by just being a little bit more proactive? And ultimately that's going to create the, the better customer experience. Um, well, in this case of the healthcare, in, in this case of the healthcare, they, they uh -huh. were also saying, how do we get more proactive about revenue and and revenue to them is a visit right yep. so how do i how do i get people to keep the appointments that they make well yeah so what if i added to every phone call so i see here that your next appointment is on june the 23rd is that mm -hmm. still good for you now i've added time to the interaction that's now yep Perhaps I've avoided an interaction in the future, mm -hmm. and I may have su successfully validated that I'm going to see that patient and I'm going to book that revenue in the future. Yeah. So a lot of times it's not automated. It could be that it's just part of the conversation that the agent's having, part of the interaction today that uh -huh. avoids the interaction in the future. It, it's funny, um, as you were going through that example, Bob, I was uh, thinking back to, um, so I, I bought a car earlier this year, a uh, new vehicle. Um, I don't know what I was thinking, but I got a good deal on it. So, you know, might as well. Um, and when it came time to get that 7,500 mile uh, checkup, about when the, when the car had about 5,000 miles, I was getting emails from uh, uh, from the manufacturer saying, hey, your car is getting to this level. Go ahead and book your appointment today to when you get to 7,500. You know, let's go ahead and, and, and put an appointment on the calendar so that we can get you in and you can get your, your, your free service, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, you know, that's pretty darn cool. You know exactly where I am in, in, um, in the lifespan of my of my vehicle and what needs to occur when it needs to occur and you're notifying me proactively that i need to go ahead and get this scheduled so i'm i keep timely with everything 
Um, we have data. We have so much data around yes. customers these year, these days. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we use it? How do we use yeah. it to, to improve the experience? And how do we use it to avoid the, the contact that costs extra, extra money? Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, with my, with my example, I didn't have to call into anybody. I didn't have to call the dealership. I was able to book online done, you know, awesome. uh, it, it, it was a great experience. You know, you know, you see that the contact center leaders, and I think you mentioned this um, before, um, you know, the, the customers, uh, contact center leaders have to be a lot more human today. Um, you know, I mean, is it, is it more so that, that that's happening today or has it always been, um, the need to be a lot more human? Well, I think the opportunity to be more human is always a value. I, I, I think that I, I've, I've been talking about having a, you know, leading with your heart for 10 or 15, 20 years mm -hmm. in this space. So I don't think it's anything new, but I, I think it's possibly of more value today that when I'm interacting with you, especially if I'm doing it in this kind of format, how do I bring human elements into that conversation? Um, there's a writer and a speaker that I have huge uh, respect for, Brene Brown, mm -hmm. that I think talks about this better than anyone that I've ever listened to. Um, she always reminds me, she's she's even on Netflix, uh -huh. but uh, she always reminds me when I, when I hear her talk that I wish I had said that. I would... I wish I had been as elegant as she was about putting that concept that I that I may live or I may know into a bite-sized chunk. So if you're out there in podcast land and you're not reading or listening or uh, Googling Brene Brown, that should be at the top of your list after this. She's fantastic. But she talks about being human and being vulnerable and being uh, bringing your whole self to the job. There, there are five things that she talks about. Don't bottle up your emotions and become self-aware. So knowing who you are and what you're wanting to bring to work, what you're wanting to bring to your, to your job is important. Uh, vulnerability takes courage. It, it, it takes courage to show that. Um, I, I don't know whether... I got some of that because of my personality, but, or whether it's just, I don't know any better than to just bring my whole self to my job. <laughs> but I, I think that it's been to my detriment at times in, in, in my job where I've been a little bit too much Bob than mm -hmm. I should have been, but I, but I would rather err on that side. She, she also talks about uh, facing fear and, and moving forward. She talks about, um, you know, don't seek excellence. Don't seek perfection. Seek excellence. Mm -hmm. And and that's an interesting in our world. I, I've had somebody tell me before, we want to be the world's best contact center in in this space. And while you're there, we want to save a lot of money. Those two things don't always match up. Exactly. You, you can show excellence and save money. But you may not be able to be perfect and save money. And then the last one she talks about is daring to be yourself. As I said, like, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to bring yourself to work. It's okay to have bad days. Um, it's okay to be who you are at your core and to be human. Um, and, and I think that as supervisor, as employees, that's who we want to be. We want to be known. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think about a guy, I, I was down in um, Panama and there was a guy there that I sat down next to and I noticed that he was, he had these model car pictures on his cube. You know, if, if, if you have a contact center where people still come to work, they will tell you what's important in their life by what they put in their cube, Right. If, 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 if she, if the lady has 27 pictures of the same child and they all are two-year-olds and she's in her fifties, she's probably really excited about a grandchild, uh, <laughs> right? So she'll yeah. tell you what's important 
So uh -huh. the human aspect of that is to ask about that person, to understand mm -hmm. and know that person, to to be engaged in their lives so that their lives are engaged in their job so that they bring themselves to work on good days and they bring themselves to work on bad days. Yeah. Bob, I mean, th that's it's a great segue um, to where I, I want to get real with you for a minute. Um, and, you know, I, I've been... Um, you know, we, we had the, the good fortune of meeting in person, you know, back 10 or so years ago, um, through Austin contact center lines. Um, I've seen you speak, um, you know, in other places, I think through ICMI, um, I follow you on, on Twitter, um, follow you on LinkedIn. And, you know, one of the things that, that really resonated with me, um, is you've experienced some, some tragedy in, in your personal life and, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how you turned something that that's that was as a parent truly heartbreaking um, into something that is is serving a greater good today? Yeah, our um, our 30 year old daughter was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2014. Um, mm -hmm. She was a daycare teacher. She was um, she loved music. Um, she was a Luke Bryan freak. Um, <laughs> Who she, isn't? She loved, oh, she would like you. Um, yeah. <laughs> she was, but above all else, she was the ultimate daughter. She, she loved unconditionally. She loved everyone around her. And so, um, when she was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer at 30 years old, we could not have been any more devastated. Mm -hmm. um, she fought for four long years, four short years. Um, she was on 14 different chemo regimens. That tells you what kind of warrior she was. Uh, she never gave up. I remember the last time they were putting her on the last chemo that they had available. She said, what's next? What if this doesn't work? That was her favorite question to ask after they chose a treatment. So I began to call her my warrior princess uh, because she was just such a sweetheart, but such a warrior. Um, and I wrote an article called um, The Question Every Dad Should Ask His Daughter. And mm -hmm. I sent it off to the Commercial Appeal during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And the focus of the article was that I asked my daughter what, whether she was being careful when she opened the door, I was asking her, was she being careful when she was getting out of the car? I asked her, did she have gas in the car? I may have been to ask her, was she going to the dentist? But I didn't ask her, was she going to the gynecologist? And I didn't ask her, was she doing monthly breast exams? And what I realize now is, you know, Mark, uh, one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in America, one in eight. And of that, about 11 to 12% of that will be diagnosed in women under 45. Yet as a rule, we don't think about breast cancer in women, even the medical in industry, the medical organizations don't think about breast cancer until a woman is in her forties or in her fifties. And so, Keisha was going to the regular doctor about things that should have been red flags, mm -hmm. but she wasn't going to the gynecologist who would look at her body differently and think through a different lens about her as a woman. Mm -hmm. So what we realized was that she needed that when you're in your twenties, you need to start going. She said, dad, I wasn't sexually active and I didn't think I needed to go to the gynecologist. Mm -hmm. She did your wife does, your daughter does. And so when I asked that question, what I was asking was, have you asked your daughter about whether she's going to the gynecologist? Have you asked her about whether she's getting a breast exam? And um, on a monthly basis, is she doing those? 80% of women who find breast cancer found it in something that they found themselves, according to the National Cancer S Society. 80% found something, something wasn't right, something wasn't the right way. 
Yeah. Um, so that tells me how important the, the last st stat I'll tell you is when it's found at her age, it's typically further in the stages as mm -hmm. it was in her because no one's looking for it. So our mission and our message is you should be looking for it. Our mission and our message is you should be on purpose about this. And um, what we have is a shower card. I can't believe I walked over to the computer without one in my hand. We'll we'll stick it up at the end of this, I think, right? We'll, we'll put yep. something at the end of this. Definitely. That start. But we have a shower card. It's, it's a round card. It hangs on the shower head. And it's just a reminder card. And a person can go onto the website, warriorprincess.org, and mm -hmm. can request one for free. We'll mail it to you for free. Hangs on your shower, just reminds you, tells you how to do a breast exam and reminds you that you need to do that on a monthly basis. You know, Bob, one of the things that, that you know, as you're going through your, you know, the, the story there, um, you know, as a parent, um, you know, you're, you're right. You, you ask your, your children, um, your daughters about all these other things, but getting getting specific about um are they doing the things that can really save their lives um you know just you know self you know self checking type of things um we don't think about that um and i, I think it's a great reminder um, well mark as a parent there's nothing harder than losing a child. It, it's yeah. just not supposed to happen. And mm -hmm. what we realized is that it happens all too frequently to people who are that age. And so that's the reason why, you know, telling her story is not always easy, but but what I what I realize is that if I if I can help one dad not tell that story. Mm -hmm. then I'm okay with telling the story. Yeah. Uh, and she's okay with it too. It it doesn't, it doesn't add, we can do nothing to add value to her life. Her life was so valuable, but we can, we can take what was a horrible experience and help others with telling her story. And so that's the reason why we started the nonprofit. We've distributed uh, over 45,000 of those breast cancer awareness cards uh, over the last two years during a pandemic. So we're mm -hmm. pretty, pretty excited about that. Um, and we would love to send anyone in your audience. In fact, if you're uh, interested in, in giving them out to all the women in your contact center, if you have breast cancer awareness week, or you have a, a women's health initiative, or you have um, anything going on in your contact center, we, we just mailed 200 of them to a company in, um, in, in Concord uh, yesterday. We uh, are distributing 5,000 of them through uh, a health a heating company here in Memphis in the month of October. So that is part of our mission is to distribute those cards. You know, Bob, I, you know, I personally have donated to your um, uh, to the to the foundation, and I will continue to do so. I think the the messaging is so important um, that um, that's uh, that's being that's being sent out. Um, you know, so if someone wants to find out more about um, how they can help, um, because you know, sending out these reminders, um, you know, these the shower cards, um, you know, it's it's not something that that can that can happen for free, but if someone wants to go ahead and make a donation or find out more about what you're doing um, with uh, with the foundation, it's Keisha Warrior Princess, correct? It's it's actually WarriorPrincess.org. Okay. So you can actually if you type in Keisha Warrior Princess.org, we own that URL also. Excellent. So it's either Keisha Warrior Princess.org or Warrior Princess.org. Yeah. The the at Keisha warrior princess is how you find us on facebook or instagram okay. so if you do a search on keisha warrior princess we will come up um in in most cases uh you you, you search warrior princess you may get a little xena in your life but <laughs> if, you, if you search warrior princess.org you'll come uh -huh. to us also so we'll put something hopefully at the end here 
are yeah. in the comments. We'll, we'll add something that'll give them information, but we would love to have donations. Those uh, shower cards cost us about a dollar and 25 cents for uh, printing and then the cost of mailing. So if you, if you donate $50, we, we like to say we'll put 50 of them in the hands of women who need them. If you donate yep. 100, we'll put 100 in their hands. We have multiple ways that we distribute distribute them. But yes, thank you for that opportunity. Yeah, and and I, I definitely encourage um, you know my audience, um, your your connections, uh, my connections, um, you know to to go ahead and and you know reach out to to um, to warriorprincess.org. And if you lead a contact center, um, you know whether it's a breast cancer awareness month or um, you know whatever may be going on um, you know in your contact center um, you know Bob will have these sent out to you uh, Bob's organization will have it, have these sent out to you um, very quickly and um, you know it, it's it's a it's a great um, uh, it's a great way to show that show your employees that you really do care about them um, 63 percent of of leaders in the contact center are women leaders, uh, which tells me that there's a, a much higher percentage of um, of women that are working in the contact center um, that could find value um, okay. from something like this. And and uh, um, you know, Bob, I, I you know I I appreciate you telling your story. Um, I know it's it, it can be difficult to talk about. Um, you know, as a parent, and and I really appreciate you uh, humanizing, um, you know, what it is that we do in our industry, and and how um, being being vulnerable, um, it, it's okay, uh, and really appreciate that. Now, with that, I'd like to go ahead and take us to the speed round. All right. So, uh, so what fact about Bob would people be surprised to learn about you? Um, concert photography. I am a concert photographer and have been doing concert photography for about 20 years. I've had, okay. the opportunity, I get, I get, I'm, I'm with a couple of local venues. I get to do the meet and greets, which means I get to meet the stars. Um, I shot Greg Allman's next to last concert here in Memphis, right when he had cancer, it was very aware that he was sick uh -huh. when he was here. I, I've shot Tony Bennett um, on stage and and at meet and greets, uh, Dinah Ross. So I've oh, I've had yeah. the opportunity to shoot some icons. Yeah, and then I've shot folks like uh, or not shot. I've taken photos of folks like Little Big Town, and uh, some of the current uh, top bands. Uh, some of my favorites were Hearts and Journey and uh, um, those kind of big bands back in the seventies. Um, but concert photography is, is a passion. It, 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 it works with the right, the, is it the right side or left side of your brain? That's creative, whichever side it is, that's the one that it, <laughs> it helps me use. There you go. It, 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 it creates balance in your life. It does. it does. I love it. I love it. Plus, you know, you, you get to go out and, and, um, you know, disconnect a little bit from everything else, um, in life. Now yeah. with that, what's your ideal off the grid location? You ever been to 30A in Florida? No, I have not. Okay, so there's there's a strip of beach uh -huh. um, in the Panhandle that runs between Panama City and um, Orange Beach, Alabama. Okay. It's a highway called 30A, and there's about seven or eight or nine little uh, enclave towns on this little two-lane road that is the most peaceful world, the whitest sand beaches oh man. I can go there i can walk out on a beach i can disconnect it is my favorite place in the world by the way it, 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 my wife taught me that so really yeah she taught me that i could learn how to i used to be a disneyland disney world let's get there for rope draft at 7 a.m and we'll leave when they make us leave the park at night that's not <laughs> the case anymore i'd rather just go sit on the beach excellent excellent and and you know from where you are i i i think that's a, a about know, seven hours history. about yeah, seven that's hours yeah. yeah yeah that's not bad um so you know I, I i'm a child of the 70s as well 
And, uh, you know, I, I remember growing up, we had these product jingles that would get stuck in, stuck in my head. And, and uh, even today, I mean, you know, I hear the friends theme, you know, anywhere and I'll, you know, I'll start, you know, you know, singing that or at the beginning where it goes, da, 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 you know, I'll, I'll do that. But what product jingle gets stuck in your head every time you hear it? Oh man. If you know this one and I say it, you're going to hate uh-huh. me for even saying it. Oh, okay. it's, it's the cars for kids, uh, <laughs> jingle. Like I try to turn the radio off quickly because it, it'll get stuck in my head and I I'm driving down the road and I'm singing 1-800 cars for kids. I, I yes. K O R S cars for kids. Yeah. Like just stop it, make it stop. But that's the one. That's the one. I mean, talk about amazing marketing. I mean, oh, it's absolutely. On, like, all the time. It's on uh, all the time. I, uh, nothing against their nonprofit. I think their nonprofit yeah. is great. If they help, if they're helping kids, fantastic. Yeah. You ask me which one gets stuck. That's yes. one that gets stuck. It does. It does. Well, Bob, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate um, you joining me today. Um, we're going to put some information on um, at the end of at the end of this. Um, you know. If someone wants to donate to Keisha Warrior Princess, um, you know, or if they just want to reach out and contact um, the uh, um, the foundation, or talk to you about anything, um, you know, related to contact centers. I mean, you've probably forgotten more than most people will ever ever learn about contact centers. Um, and uh, my, my gray you know, my gray beard my gray beard says I've 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 I've, I've been in it as well. So there yeah, you go. <laughs> You, you, you know, you've been there, done that, got the T-shirt and a few battle scars, too. Absolutely. So, um, but, uh, you know, we'll we'll definitely put some information up at the end. And and again, I really want to thank you. Um, you know, I'm very humble to to have you on as a guest on on Coffee Talk with Brohawk. And uh, I, I just find that every time I'm able to have a conversation with you, um, you know, I, I just learn a little bit more. So thank, thank you, you very much. Very, very uh, much appreciate the opportunity. And uh, again, um, you know, if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about um, uh, warrior pr- warriorprincess.org, um, you know, we'll have some information. And, um, you know, Bob, we'll definitely get a, a, a picture of that, uh, that shower uh, card uh, okay. that we'll put out here as well. So okay. sounds um, great. Well, thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Coffee Talk with Brohawk. Bob, thank you very much. We appreciate your time today. Thanks.